Good morning. Good to see you all here this beautiful morning. It gets, it's cold in the morning, and then it's going to be wonderful this afternoon. So just hang in there. If you have a prayer request, I'd ask you to please fill out the prayer slip, and the ushers will pick them up during the singing of our first hymn. Our Lenten Bible study continues tomorrow. We're meeting each Monday through Lent with our last meeting March 30th. And even though we've already had two meetings, you can come join us at any time. We meet from 10.30 to 12. And we're using the book Final Words by Adam Hamilton. During the season of Lent, we're collecting items for Domestic Violence Coalition. And what they've asked for is liquid dish detergent, liquid laundry detergent, fabric softener, tall kitchen garbage bags, paper towels, or toilet paper. Any of those things would be appreciated. We have a little green table over here in the corner where the hugs tree usually stands, and we've already got some over there, so um, I hope y'all will bring some. This morning, the altar flowers are given to the glory of God and in honor of Cynthia Little as a birthday remembrance by Holly, Doug, Carly, Heath and Hank. So the flowers are gorgeous. Thank you, Cynthia, for having a birthday that we can have the flowers. That's wonderful. And lastly, I meant to say this a couple weeks ago, but I want to remind you, because we hear it on the news all the time, about not shaking hands. We need to, I don't know, you can bump elbows, or a smile and a kind word is still a good greeting. Just, the thing is, we're deep in the flu season. We have some people in our congregation that have compromised health situations, and we don't want anyone to get sick. Of course, there's that coronavirus thing going around too. But just remember, you know, to be careful, wash your hands, all that fun stuff. Okay? So those are the announcements I have. Let's begin with our call to worship. our call to worship from the bulletin. The God of Abram leads us forward. We are the God, God is The God of Abram is here to bless us. Bless us, O oh God, that we might be blessed. The God of Abram leads us forward. We are the God, God is
recite the Apostles' Creed in unison. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Psalter is found at page 844 in the hymn book. This is Psalm 121, and we sing the response. I lift up my eyes, eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, the one who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day. Nor the, moon by night. the Lord will keep you from all evil and will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. covenant lesson is from Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 4. If you want to, if you'd like to follow in the Pew Bible, it's at page 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse, and by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thank be to God. God. Will the children please come down at this time? I think I got a crowd today. Okay. Oh boy, Hank's gonna join us today. Yay! I like them boots, buddy. See where are you gonna sit. There once was a man named Nicodemus, and he came to Jesus late one night because he was hungry. Now he really wasn't looking for a late night snack that you might think. He was hungry for spiritual food. He was hungry for the truth about the kingdom of God. He came to Jesus because he had questions, and he knew that Jesus would have the answers. Now, Nicodemus reminds me of a very hungry caterpillar. Y'all know that book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar? You've read that book, haven't you, when you were little? You know what I'm talking about. 
Well, the story begins with a tiny egg on a leaf in the light of the moon. And on Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and pop out of the egg came a very small and very hungry caterpillar. He began to eat and eat and eat, and he was still hungry. Finally, he had eaten so much that he had a stomach ache. The next day was Sunday again, and the caterpillar ate through a nice green leaf, and his stomach felt so much better. Now, I'm not saying you need to eat a green leaf if your stomach hurts you. Yeah, you know. You read this book? He built a small house called a cocoon around himself and stayed in there for more than two weeks. Then he nibbled a hole in the cocoon and pushed his way out. But he wasn't a caterpillar anymore. What was he? A butterfly, that's right, a beautiful butterfly. That's a good story, isn't it? That's a nice story. Well, this hungry caterpillar reminds me of what Jesus told this man, Nicodemus. The hungry caterpillar could help Nicodemus understand what Jesus said. So this is what Nicodemus said to Jesus. He said, teacher, we all know that God has sent you to teach us no one could perform the miracles that you were doing if God was not with him. And then Jesus said something so amazing and confusing for Nicodemus. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, wait a minute, what are you saying? How can a man be born again? So Jesus went on to explain what he meant by that. He meant when the Spirit of God enters into your heart, humans can reproduce human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. And that's what it means to be born again. So let's think about that story about that very hungry caterpillar. When he came out of his cocoon, he was a totally new creation. A butterfly and that's what it is when we are born again when we allow Jesus to come into our heart he makes us a new creation let us pray dear God we praise you that in Jesus we are a new creation the old has gone the new has come in Jesus name we pray amen thank y'all I have a number of praises and concerns to share with you this morning. Um, Sandy Bruni had had some personal prayers that she'd been lifting up, and she says to us, Praise, prayers were answered, thank you God. So that's a wonderful, wonderful. Another person didn't put their name. They want prayers for their grandson that's having surgery on Thursday. Five-hour surgery on Thursday. So keep him in your prayers. And then Luke has asked us to pray for his grandma, Peggy. That's Peggy Burr. She's on our prayer list. So let's remember those. I want us to also um, continue to keep Marissa Hardison Thomas in our prayers as she recuperates from her surgery. Evelyn Capel's at home. Elwood Green is going through treatments. Bill and Doris Bias. Fred Ross Marsh is now going to be staying at Wadesboro Health and Rehab. They've moved him, his stuff out of Metaview. He needs a little bit more assistance than he can get at Metaview. So he's going to be at Wadesboro Health and Rehab. And of course, Chuck Kaiser, Kelly Shepard that we prayed for last week. And also, I got a message this morning that um, Betty Huntley has been moved to the hospice house in Pinehurst. The chaplain from First Health left us, First Health Hospice, I guess it is, left us a message on the answering machine. 
And so let's keep their family in our prayers. And if you all know Betty's daughters, you might want to contact them if, if you'd like to. But I wanted to lift that up to you too. And of course, continued prayers for all those on our prayer list and those anonymous prayers that God knows all about. We lift them up at this time. Let us go to God in prayer. Loving God, you delight in showing us your kingdom, a place of blessing, a place of light, a place of spirit and truth. May we be born anew in your spirit, that we might see the glory that you have in store for us and for the world. For you sent your Son into our world, not to condemn us or put us to shame, but that we might have life and have it abundantly. We pray all this in the names that we have mentioned out loud and on our hearts, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward at this time to receive our morning offering? Let us pray. Gracious God, just as you blessed Abram when he ventured out in faith, you have blessed us with so much. Help us see our gifts and offerings not as fruit of our hard work, but as blessings that we have received from your generous hand. In grateful response to our many blessings, we offer you these gifts and tithes and offerings that they may bless a world in need. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen.
Would you please remain standing for our gospel reading? I'll be reading from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verse 32 and verse 39 through 43, and you can find this in your pew Bible on page 919. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. You may be seated. Have you ever wondered just what paradise was like? Well, in our Bible study, in the book we're using, Final Words, Adam Hamilton shared this story that I think um, really says something powerful. There was a doctor who made house calls back in the day when that's what doctors did. He took his dog with him in his horse and buggy. One day he visited a dying man as a, and as he went into the man's house, he left his dog on the front step. The dying man said to the doctor, Doc, what's it gonna be like? You know, heaven, what will it be like? At that very moment, the doctor's dog began to scratch at the door, whimpering and whining to get in. The doc stopped, and he said, Do you hear that? Yes, the man replied. The doctor continued, That's my dog. He has never been inside your house. He doesn't know what's on the other side of this door. All he knows is that his master is in here. And if his master is in here, it must be okay. Powerful, simple, powerful. You can use that if you need to explain that to some people. Well, there was a high school class that gathered for its 25th year reunion. People had looked forward to this summer event. Several of them had gone on diets. Some had bought new dresses or shoes or ties. Classmates tucked photos of their families into their pockets, and they headed for the large downtown hotel. Once there, noises of surprise and happiness filled the hall, but there were some awkward moments. One of the worst was when a classmate came up with a big grin and said, Remember me? It was a terrifying moment because people change. Bodies are larger or slimmer, Hair colors changed, hair had receded or disappeared altogether. 25 years had dimmed memories. There the person stood, expecting to be identified. It was embarrassing and impossible to tell who had asked, remember me? Later on, people gathered in small groups, comparing experiences and remembering friends. One man had become prominent in his field. Well, said a classmate, isn't that something? He certainly was no angel in college. And so the conversations went. A summer evening of fun and gossip and remembering. A reunion. But let's go back to that astonished response of that classmate when told of the success of another. Well, he certainly was no angel in college. The implication was that this man had not deserved or earned his good fortune. Interesting, isn't it, how we question whether people deserve their success. We express it in phrases like, did she get a good break? Or, he's lucky considering his attitude. Or, can you believe it? She never worked a day in her life. You know, when we interpret the events of life in that way, 
It simplifies our thinking. Things work out evenly, predictably. We try to live by worldly mottos. You get what you deserve. Crime doesn't pay. The guys in the white hats win. Hard work always pays off. The innocent will be set free, and you know more and more. We often transfer these formulas to our understanding of theology. If you have troubles now, then you must have sinned earlier. Or we believe that when you are virtuous, God will bless your life with good things. Or we hold the classic colonial American belief that when people are wealthy, it's a sign that they're better than other people. There are many indications that people still hold those opinions today. The ways of the world have tidy answers to life. According to those maxims, life is very fair. Well, no wonder Job had a lot of trouble fitting his unhappy circumstances into the mottos of the world. He didn't seem to deserve to have problems. He'd been a good person. It just wasn't fair. Well, throughout Jesus' ministry, he taught us that our ways of thinking and acting are not God's ways. The last shall be first, he warned to their astonishment. In a parable, Jesus told us about the owner of a vineyard who paid latecomers as much as those that had worked all day. These are definitely not the rules of the world. And then on Good Friday, on a cross alongside Jesus, a thief embodied that contrast between the world's rules and God's. He told another criminal, we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. You see, the thief recognized the injustice in Jesus' execution. A thief, like himself, deserved condemnation, not Jesus. And then the thief did something amazing. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It was a statement of belief, not from a disciple, but from a criminal. Those we might have expected to stand by Jesus through hard times had left him. Fiercely loyal Peter denied knowing him. Others hid away in fear. Who spoke of Jesus and his kingdom? A thief. You know, the passion story is filled with characters who do the unexpected. Disciples fall asleep. The enemies who are responsible for the death of this rabbi, son of God, are not the Romans, but the Jews. At their insistence, a ruthless highwayman goes free and a mild-mannered teacher is killed. And who calls Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God? Not his friends and supporters. No, it's Pilate who nails the title King of the Jews to his cross. It is a Roman soldier who confesses, truly, this man was God's son. As always, God's ways are not our ways. God speaks and acts through whomever God chooses. On the one hand, Pilate lives by the world's rules. Finding Jesus innocent, he arranges events into an exercise of weights and balances. He sentences Jesus, but frees Barabbas. Even so, God chooses to use Pilate as the one to name Jesus king. And what Jew would ever imagine that the promise Messiah of God would die? It was diametrically contrary to all their expectations of the Messiah coming in glory to establish the kingdom of the people of Israel. The disciples refused to believe the predictions of Jesus regarding his death. Peter tried to prevent Jesus from saying it. It was unbelievable. It was frightening. 
they and we are always surprised by God whose ways are not our ways. Jesus, said the condemned thief, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, it's ironic. The disciples hid. The religious leaders scoffed. But it was the repentant thief who pleaded for forgiveness. Did the thief deserve forgiveness? Not by worldly standards. In life, isn't it true we get what we deserve? If we sin now, we pay later, right? Crime doesn't pay, the innocent go free, the white hats win. According to the world, the thief deserves condemnation, deserves death. And to our chagrin and amazement, the Messiah dies and the thief is told, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Once again, we're startled. The last are first? God does it again. The laborers are paid the same, even for different work contributions. What, what kind of way is that to run a business? Well, it's God's way, and thank God for it. For although we don't always want to acknowledge it, we deserve to die. We certainly aren't angels either. We are insensitive and self-centered and self-righteous. And there's a dark side in all of us that we keep carefully hidden or covered up by virtuous acts. We don't care to expose our true nature. If the truth be known, we deserve to die. We deserve to die, but we can be like that thief. We can repent. We can plead to the Savior that we also may be welcomed into the kingdom. And with the death and resurrection of Jesus, we will live. At the great reunion in eternity, we will be remembered. We won't deserve it. We can't be good enough to earn it. Our wealth is not an indication of our virtue or goodness. It may be quite the opposite. But when we who must die to this life say, Jesus, remember me, he will. Even from the cross, he promised us that for God, death is not the final word. Today, he says, you will be with me in paradise. Thanks be to God.
Remember Jesus on the cross saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. What glorious news, praise God. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.